Uh, I lived in Wigan in those days on the outskirts of Wigan, and one of the venues, we went to see the show in Manchester, the Town of Motown Road Show, and we were out as salesmen selling in the new Tamla records on the, their own label. And I mean, the people in the shops were enthusiastic. We sold shitloads of this stuff, right? And of course, it was a disaster. The, the actual tour was an absolute disaster. And I, I remember going to see the, um, the one in Wigan, because I lived locally, and I went to the club there, which get, later became the big Northern Soul Club in, in Wigan. And they were in this theater, and I was standing as it opened, I remember this to this day, it still thrills me, the sound of the build-up, the music, the Tamla beat, and it, great stuff. And I was standing next to Martha, Martha Reeves, and the Vandellas on the other side of the stage, and the curtains are still down, and the voiceover said, welcome to the Tamla Motown Roadshow, and will you give a big warm welcome to Martha and the Vandellas, and they came on the other side singing, dancing in the street, you know. And I looked out over the lights, and there were two people sitting down there, <laughs> over there. I doubt there were 50, 60 people in the bloody theatre. And, um, you know, and then suddenly, from nowhere, uh, three or four months later, it just popped. And it, it had its time. But while I remember it, I want to go back to the pie story. This is the beginning of the 59. Now, that was Emil Ford. And I was selling box quanta. This thing was roaring out. And, and then suddenly it began to spread around the country. I said, hey, we've got a hit, because we had nothing else. And uh, everybody's going around being quite chuffed about it. Now, how they got him was that Pi were doing, uh, to start their business, they were doing a lot of talent shows and various things in dance halls and so on. And they did a talent contest somewhere in South London. And Emil won. And his prize was to cut a record. They got, they got him in the studio. Oh, yeah, he should turn up. And so he came in. And then nobody's very interested because there's some black guy come in to, you know, so, so they go out and they think, oh, there's this thing that's been done in America, this might suit you. And it had a minor, it was a minor hit in the States, so they put that on the A side. And then they thought, what would we put on the B side? So they put, what do you want to make those eyes at me for? And it began to take off and it was roaring up the bloody charts. And somebody somewhere in Pi head office remembered they didn't have this guy under contract. <laughs> so they just rush around like lunatics, try, and I don't think he had any management. I mean, and he did not. He should not have signed the deal. I mean, he really could have had them over corals. As it turned out, he, he didn't make it anyway. My brother-in-law took me to the shop, and, and it was before the new one opened, and it was in uh, Great Charlotte Street. And uh, I stand in like the butler. But Frank said, "I'll go in and get Mr. Brian out." So I had to open the back doors and stand like the butler, you know. And Brian came out and sort of looked me up and down as much like some of the cat had dragged in and he looked in and he said, yes, very well, Mr. Wallace, but um, you will still call us from, from Manchester every morning, will you? And Frank said, well, if you want me to, Mr. Brian, but, but, you know, John will be around here and he can come and see you when it's done. No, I'd, I'd, I'm much happier with your service from, from Manchester. So I thought, all right, and he just done his heel. He didn't speak to me at all. So for the next several weeks, I went in and out there twice a week and got nothing. Anyway, this was, I went in one day and he said, no, I have nothing, I need no, I have nothing. Oh, he said, have you, have you got any of the, uh, the Chris Barber EP, you remember this, the Petite Fleur? And I said, yes. And he said, oh. He said, well, you, your devil doesn't have any. And I said, well, I've got some. So he said, oh, so he ordered some. And then he said, well, well perhaps you ought to call. So I started calling on him. And then I, I left, of course, I got, and I, I went to Thompson Diamonds. And uh, uh, that was van selling. And he gave me two labels. I had Capital and Fontana. I used to go in and see him twice a week. And one Saturday morning, this is, takes you back to your youth. I went in one Saturday morning to see if there's anything needed. And he, he had some stuff. He gave me some stuff, the order ready. And he said, oh, have you got any of the, the Charlie Drake, please, Mr. Custer single? And I said, uh, yeah. He said, how many have you got? And I said, oh, I don't know. There's 120 something. There's certainly four or five boxes. He said, I'll have them. I said, oh, what? I said, you got, I've got other customers to go and see. He said, John, have you sold them to the guy? And I said, no. He said, well, you can only sell them once. And I thought, well, I'll have to give them this. And that, the rest of the customers that day, the first thing they asked me as I went through the door, and I said, no. So when he got them and signed for them, he said, now, he said, I'll tell you, um, EMI are out of stock of this, Source Selector, 
I've been on to your company in London and they haven't got any stock. So if anybody in Liverpool wants to buy this single today, they're going to have to come to me.